But tonight's topic is sex. And it's difficult to uh, discuss that in church, but it must be discussed. Because there's a greater danger by not striking out and speaking directly to the greatest sin that we see in our nation here today. And that's a misunderstanding of what the scriptures say about sex. Uh, have you ever heard of Chernobyl? Anybody heard of that? That big old Russian explosion that happened back in 1982? Chernobyl was a nuclear power plant. It was, uh, they were doing certain tests down there in Chernobyl and uh, they decided they were gonna go in and they were gonna do these tests and they kept turning off these fail safes, these safety mechanisms on the computer. They go up to the next part uh, to do this test and say, do not go farther than this, you are in danger. And we'll just push that aside. Do not go farther than this. You're in danger. We'll just push that off the side. And I reckon they went through at least six different fail-safes before they finally got to the end and boom, right? That nuclear explosion. It was uh, known as one of the biggest uh, explosions of a factory and, and, and nuclear explosion that we've seen in our world today. But many of churches have done that about the topic of sex as well. They have skipped over those uncomfortable passages that we don't kind of want to talk about in the midst of everyone else. And they, they've kept quiet about it. And they make people feel good with those other type of passages that just fill you up and you go out the door and you're happy-go-lucky, right? But the Scriptures speak a lot about sex within the Word of God. And we're not going to turn off the fail-safes tonight to make you feel comfortable or make the preacher feel comfortable as he discusses these things. I'm going to share the truth about what the Bible says about sex. And the Bible's teaching on sex is very clear. And yet Christians today have many wrong views upon this topic. It isn't just a modern problem either. The topic has been all across the board throughout church history about what sex is. It goes from the idea of it's taboo to even speak about it. You don't even mention it. It is only for procreation and that's it. Nobody should ever have any discussion about it to the idea that the perversion of it should be celebrated on our streets and in the churches. So there's a lot of false teachings on these type of things. Now, both of these views are, are unbiblical, and I'm going to show you uh, why that is here tonight. It's no wonder that our enemy, the devil, wants to keep the truth about this topic confusing to people. It's no wonder. Sex is a gift from God and the most intimate expression that two individual human beings can experience in life. Of course the devil would want to corrupt that. Of course he would. If I were the devil, I certainly would want to keep the truth about it unclear because we know from Scripture what does the devil want to do, church? He comes to steal, he comes to kill, and he comes to destroy, right? But what did our Lord come to do? That we may have life, and that more abundantly, right? He wants to give us life, and yet we go to this perversion, this wickedness, and these other things. So let's not let the devil destroy the most basic of human topics for us here this evening. Now, I want to go over just a little bit of those two wrong views. First of all, the idea that some have taught that sex is only for having children, and other than that, it's an evil which should be avoided. Uh, maybe you've heard that kind of teaching before, right? you know, over the years. Maybe you've heard that said. Now, that's a difficult thing to prove from the Word of God, though. You know what I'm saying? Because the Song of Solomon is an entire book about sexual intimacy. Now, the people who say that uh, it's this other way, they would say, well, no, it's all allegory about the Messiah. But folks, I wonder if they've actually read the book, okay? In, in the Song of Solomon, they used to take that, the young Jewish boys and girls, before they become of age, they told them they were not allowed to read from that book until they come a certain age. So I don't think it was just because there was prophecy within that book they weren't allowed to read it. There were things there that were uh, a little bit deeper than they needed to get into at their age. Another wrong view is that there are no perverted or wrong views of sex. It's okay to live together. There ain't nothing wrong with that. That's what people will say. Oh, it's okay for homosexuality. It's love. Love is what's important, people will say. There's no perverted views. And then again, you have another hard 
uh, hard line to try to prove that from the Word of God, right? You've got chapter after chapter that tells us that there are certain things, certain things that God has prescribed in sex and certain things that God says is an abomination and it is wrong in sex. And there are plenty of false churches and teachers today who are conforming to the world's views on what that is. So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and read what our Baptist faith and message says here tonight. It says this. It says, Marriage is God's unique gift to provide for the man and the woman in marriage the framework for intimate companionship. The channel of sexual expression according to biblical standards and the means for the procreation of the human race. Now, uh, once a Christian marriage has been initiated, it becomes the framework for certain things that uh, you should not and really cannot occur with anyone before marriage occurs. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7 makes this really clear. If you want to write this down and go back to it later. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 through 5, it says this, uh, Paul is talking, they've asked him a question about is it okay to stay single? And Paul says this, he says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So what is Paul saying here? It's okay for you to be single. What does he equate with being single? Not touching a woman, right? He's talking to a male here. That's what he is equating that with. If you're going to be single, you're not going to be having sex outside of marriage. Because what does Paul call that? He calls that fornication. And that's a word that's been forgotten in many a place today. That's sex outside of the marriage bond. And so Paul says, uh, to avoid that, you should go ahead and get married. Let every, uh, man, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. And then he goes on and talks about what happens on the other side of marriage. He says, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontency. So the idea here is, uh, once you're married, uh, like I tell many of the ones who sit down with me for marriage and counseling, before it's no, 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 and after it's go, 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 okay? That's the idea here. He's saying that uh, when you're in marriage, uh, you are to come together, and Satan will try to destroy that coming together in that sexual bond. He will. He will get in the details, and, and you should not keep one another from one another unless you ask the other one and say, I'm going to prayer, I'm going to fast, or some reason, I just cannot do this right now, and the other one will consent. And that's what the Word of God teaches us about these things. And it very clearly tells us that there is Satan is trying to get in the details of sex, isn't he? Does Satan not tempt you? Think he's tempting that single person? Think he's tempting that married person in the other direction? Satan wants to destroy this most intimate gift of God. So there's a change that occurs in the relationship between a man and woman after marriage has occurred. And it goes on to say that marriage provides for the man and woman in marriage, is what we read in our Baptist Faith and Message, the framework for intimate companionship. So what does that mean? Well, the scripture says in Ephesians 5, it gives the husband and the wife and, and relays what that looks like. And it, it relays it to Christ and the church. It starts out, he says, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. It means you both need to submit to one another, right? You're both on equal footing there. But then it tells the wife to submit unto their own husbands as unto the Lord. So the wife is supposed to uh, set herself aside, submit to the husband in marriage, and trust him in that. And then it tells the husbands to do this. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And then, uh, finally, at the end of that chapter, it says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So there's an order there. I'll talk more about that order uh, the next business meeting when we sit down and talk about these things. But tonight, let's look specifically here at this. It says, Submit to one another. 
That means to put oneself aside for the better. A husband and a wife have to put oneself aside to take care of the other one, right? What does that require? What does that require for you to submit to someone else? It requires trust. Absolute trust. I'm not submitting to anybody unless I can trust them, right? I'm not submitting to anybody. Now, for a wife to submit to her husband, what does that require? Trust. That means she has to say, well, I'm going to follow your lead in this. I'm going to trust you in what you're saying to do. I might not agree with it. I might not like it. But I trust you. I trust you. Now, what does it take for a husband to truly love his wife so much that he would be willing to die for her as Jesus did for the church? What does that require, church? Trust. Trust, right? You've got to trust that woman. I'm not giving my life up for nobody unless I trust them, right? Right? So all of these things, when people speak of intimacy in today's culture, you know what they start out speaking about? They go straight to physical sex. That's the first thing that runs through their mind. That's intimacy and all these things. But we're different than that, church. Where does it begin here? Uh, the reality is that intimacy begins in the heart before anything else. That's where intimacy takes place, an absolute trust with one another. And that's the only way that you can come together. Our first uh, mother and father, Adam and Eve, when they were in the Garden of Eden, you know what the Scripture says? It says they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, why were our first parents uh, not unashamed here uh, before each other in the Garden of Eden? They completely trusted one another. There was no fear whatsoever that one was going to harm the other one, right? They had complete trust. And, and that's where it has to begin in a marriage. You build, to, uh, as you date one another, you come together, you build up that trust till you come to that point where marriage is ready, right? A trust, and that is what intimacy is. Now, we live outside that perfect Garden of Eden, right? We live outside. It's going to take a little work sometimes for us to work in trust. Sometimes we lose trust in one another, and we've got to work that back in again, folks. Folks, everything, everything comes down to the heart. The next thing it tells us was it's also the channel of sexual expression marriage is according to biblical standards. Now, what are biblical standards in marriage, well, the physical act of sex, according to the Word of God, is that it's only to be between one man and one woman in marriage. In marriage. Now, in our day, waiting for physical intimacy in marriage has fallen on hard times. You don't see that so often as you used to. But this is what the Word of God says. Marriage is generally uh, is no longer viewed as necessary in a relationship by many people. We'll just go live together. The number of couples who have decided to live together without the commitment of marriage continues to grow. One recent news, news headline said, living together without getting married, that's the new norm, right? And the National Center for Health Statistics reported that for almost half uh, of women ages 15 to 44, their first union was cohabitation rather than marriage. What's cohabitation, Scott? Cohabitation is defined as the state of living together and having a sexual relationship without being married. Now, the Bible has a completely different view on it than the modern culture, okay? This is what the Word of God says. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now, notice the clear distinction here. The Bible makes between the relationship uh, before and after marriage here physically. I once heard a Christian teacher, and he tried to say uh, that there was nowhere in the Bible that taught abstinence before marriage. I believe he missed this verse, okay? I believe he missed a whole lot of verses that are all over the Word of God. The Bible is clear that physical intimacy in marriage is honorable. Listen to what they say. Marriage is honorable. It also says that the bed is undefiled. It isn't dirty. It is a God's gift to a man and woman within marriage. But outside of marriage, what is it? It says you're either becoming a whore, and that's what the Word of God says, 
or a whoremonger, and that's the male version of a whore. That's what God thinks of those who are having sex outside of marriage. And what about those who would stray away and find somebody else beside their husband and wife in a marriage? God calls them adulterers, right? And it very clearly, very clearly says that these groups, God is going to judge, right? There'll be a judgment upon these groups. Now, folks, I don't know how it can be more clear than what the Word of God says, right? And yet the whole world has gone after sin and just rejected what the Word of God says. But, folks, there's coming a day of judgment on these things, isn't there? Will you be ready? Are you ready on that day of judgment? Finally, this. It says that it is a means for the procreation of the human race. Now, marriage is between a man and a woman. I, I would have never thought 20, 30 years ago that I'd have to stand up and tell anybody that. And it would be a surprise or a shock that it's between a man and a woman. It's very clear biology shows us uh, that this is the way the human race continues, right? It's for the procreation of the human race. Now, some couples can't have children, and, and that's all right. That's, that's just part of how things are. But that's what it's supposed to be, right? God explains this very well in the first book of the Bible. Uh, he looked to Adam and Eve, the first man, the first woman. What did he say? Uh, he blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth because God desired that every child have a father and a mother in a family committed together. Why? Because they need a dad and they need a mom, don't they? They need those things. But I tell you what, if you as you look out here across the world today, our, our culture and what's coming up here next, in the in the years ahead, if can things continue the way they are, I just don't know. I don't know what to expect. I don't know what to expect. Mankind has rejected God's plan. We live in a fallen world. It's increasingly rejecting God's authoritative word. And when they put together these words, reflecting what the scripture teaches in the Baptist faith in Message 2000, uh, they did that, I believe, with a sense of prophecy on their lips because they knew what was coming in the days ahead. And they knew that people, even then, were teaching the clear opposite of what the Bible teaches. Why were they getting away with teaching the clear opposite of what the Bible teaches when it's so clear in the Bible? Because many others were teaching the other end of the spectrum. This idea that sex is evil, wicked, and it's not to be had. I mean, it's just crazy. This is why one person explained it to me. He said, sex is like a, a, a fire, a beautiful fire that's set up inside a fireplace, right? If you get in a fireplace, you can warm yourself. It's comfortable. It's nice. But you take that same fire and you go put it out of the fireplace and you set it in the middle of the room, what's going to happen? It's going to burn the whole house down, right? Because it's not being used in the place where it's supposed to be at, right? Folks, there, there is good and bad, and the Bible clearly shows us these things. Now today, there's nobody standing for traditional marriage except those few Bible believers that's left around here. But we have to continue to do this. Children need a mom and a dad committed to one another in a family. Boys and girls growing up today need to know the righteous path to a fulfilling marriage. And folks, I'll just say it. Sin is still sin. And there is a judgment coming on sin, right? What if we have failed? What if we failed in keeping sexually pure in this confusing time we live in? Is there nothing that we can do about it? Well, our God has made a way of forgiveness will simply trust what he says about these things and reject these false beliefs all around us. I love this verse. I absolutely love this verse. Scripture says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he'll do that, won't he? He'll do that. Say, I'm living together in this situation. Well, come out of that. Come apart from one another. Separate and come together and be married as God has called you to do. Say, I'm involved in a homosexual relationship. Do as 1 Corinthians 6 says. And come out from among them and be cleansed, as the Scripture tells us, right? And be healed by what the Word of God tells us. Folks, I tell you what. that We have the answer that this world needs. 
We cannot shut up about it because people want to turn us off in such an hour as this. Because the truth will stand when the world's on fire, won't it? The truth will stand. Let's repent of our false beliefs about what God clearly says is His gift to humanity, which is sex. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church.